Good morning or good afternoon, as the case might have it. Uh, my name is Luc van Dijk. I'm the founder and CEO of The Dalian, and it's an honor to be invited at the Dubai Haley Show. I'm sorry I cannot do this uh, in person on a stage. Uh, the video conference facility will have to suffice. Uh, I would like to talk to you today about uh, The Dalian's plans to get to full autonomous flight, and in particular, the certification aspects that need to be tackled. The Dalian is based in Zurich, in Switzerland. We are uh, about 45 people dedicated to the problem of autonomous flight control. We have a number of pilots. We have a very strong academic presence. We started in 2016 when we saw the first eVTOL projects uh, becoming public. And we realized that for these things to be successful, they would have to be uh, fully autonomous in, in the long term. Since then, we've realized that there's already a lot of headroom in aircraft that fly today. Uh, fixed wing and helicopters that fly today are you know, pretty safe, but not that safe. When you hear that commercial air traffic is safe, uh, what you don't hear is that in the smaller aircraft, the uh, incident and accident rate is 200 times as high. So while the um, safety record of aviation is truly something to marvel at, we should also not fool ourselves to think that there is no headroom. So uh, with that in mind, uh, today uh, our systems are, go beyond the eVTOLs of the future, and we focus on the value we can already bring for helicopters that fly today. A helicopter that refuses to fly into the ground or dangerous terrain, a helicopter that tells you that there are cables around you that you really should not fly into, um, a helicopter that can safely auto-rotate <laughs> to uh, the best possible emergency landing place. These are things that bring value today. For that, uh, we realized early on, uh, there's no choice but to get to full autonomy because uh, there's already a shortage of pilots uh, and already pilots are flying at the edge of human capability with the use of the airspace that is there today. So there's no choice but to get to systems where uh, the humans are taking out of the low-level control loops and the machines uh, perform better uh, at higher density and with more safety guarantees. So we set out to develop a fully autonomous autopilot that clearly outperforms the human on every measurable dimension um, to be able to fly in the system of rules and regulations for civil aviation that has evolved over the past 120 years. Um, in particular, without having to completely change all the rules for certification. So what we did was we took the uh, commercial pilot license skill test for helicopters, which is a small booklet by published by the FAA, which describes what it is that humans actually are supposed to prove they can do well in their check ride. This provides a nice roadmap of uh, what it is that humans actually do in flight. And then you realize that humans often start flying in what's called visual flight rules in visual conditions, because there you can fly with very little dependency on air traffic control and other external situations, because the full autonomy is on board with the pilot to make the decisions about the flight. So it's a very nice starting point for this autonomous flight, because you don't have to start integrating with, with air traffic control, and you can start experimenting in uh, simpler setups. So we took these standards and we distilled from it what it is that uh, human pilots actually do. And then in visual conditions, it's no surprise that people use their eyes. So a pilot with his or her eyes open and hands on the control can fly legally and effectively uh, an aircraft from A to B and safely um, by using his or her eyes to see where you are, where you can fly, so where there are other people flying that you shouldn't fly into, and where you can land, which is arguably the most critical part of flying. So we built systems that can, uh, just like this, use a camera to look out um, to the outside and recognize where we are without relying on GPS. So GPS is truly a miracle, but it is um, a different thing to try to use it in a safety critical uh, situation because it can be switched off by anyone with a jammer or with control of the satellites. Um, and humans have flown around reliably without GPS for a century, um, so, or almost a century. So uh, that is uh, function number one, that you have to be able to 
uh, replicate. The very first function that a human pilot flying in VFR in visual conditions uh, uses his or her eyes for is seeing where you are so that you know how to get to the place that you want to go to. This is really fundamental to any form of control. If you don't know where you are, you don't know how you can get to another place. So um, with that, we have developed a system that just like a human can just look out the window or out of the camera, depending on where you mount it, and from the motion of the picture can reconstruct the motion of the aircraft. Here you see our camera mounted uh, under a helicopter flying over beautiful Switzerland and recognizing the self motion by uh, reconstructing uh, from how the image changes. And uh, separately, the system can actually recognize landmarks. So just like uh, looking out the window and seeing um, the, the impressive towers that make out the skyline uh, of your beautiful city, uh, in Switzerland, you can recognize certain characteristic mountaintops uh, by their shape. Uh, you can recognize uh, lakes and coastlines. If you fly from San Francisco to LA, you can follow mountain ridges and coastlines that will um, uh, ground you to, uh, to Earth without the need for GPS. The second function you have to be able to replicate is, and this is a legal requirement, you need to use your eyes to uh, deconflict with other traffic. Um, so other traffic may not show up on the radar. Uh, even if your radar is broken, that's not an excuse to fly into other things. And if you fly uh, without um, guidance from air traffic control, it is your responsibility on board. Um, so this is uh, another capability required to mimic um, uh, how human pilots fly. Deconflict with other traffic in the air that may or may not show up on the radar. Um, humans aren't actually very good at this. So what you typically do as the pilot of a small aircraft is you hear on the radar or, or you hear on the radio uh, or you see on the radar that there should be something at 10 o'clock and you and all your passengers start staring in that direction to see if you can make it out. So it's fairly easy to make a system that outperforms the human uh, here because while the human eye is truly a marvel of efficiency, it also requires uh, pointing in the right direction. And we can look at all megapixels in our image simultaneously. Uh, so we don't have to divide our attention. Um, and we can make out things that you know, fly around as well. You have to realize that the dangerous things are the things that don't seem to move against the background because they are on a collision course with you. So this is another system that we have uh, proven in practice, uh, uh, working on helicopters and fixed wing. Uh, here demonstrated over a beautiful Switzerland. And thirdly, and arguably the most important one, is um, finding places to safely land, either uh, regular landing spaces, so like a runway, um, or um, emergency landing uh, spots where you have to make the call, what is the least undesirable option to land? For example, here you see the truck riding into the safe spaces and being eliminated. So this is clearly the type of judgment call that is currently exclusively the domain of the human pilot. And that's not a coincidence because a robot, uh, just like a human, uh, would have to uh, deal with uncertainty in the environment. And currently in avionics, all this uncertainty is wholesale delegated to the human. And the w one way to think about this is that a human with no instruments, maybe an airspeed indicator, but other, other instruments are all purely optional. And, a human with almost no instruments is uh, can fly a plane, but there are no instruments today that can safely and legally fly the plane all by themselves because they have to make these judgment calls like, is this safe or is this not safe? To bring these types of functions to the world of uh, automatic systems requires a whole new type of avionics. So to make the kind of system that can make these judgment calls, you have to bring what is called AI, artificial intelligence, to the world of safety critical aerospace. If you do that effectively, it's our conviction that we can preserve or increase the safety uh, while uh, uh, increasing the, the density of economic use of the airspace. To bring this situational awareness to uh, the world of machines, uh, it's called AI, but AI is a very nebulous concept, so we prefer to, learn, to talk about machine learning, uh, which is a class of techniques where instead of creating code by uh, feeding a group of programmers sufficient coffee and chocolate so that they can handcraft 
lines of uh, computer code, we use uh, a machine to, uh, as the word says it, to machine learn a solution to a class of problems. And um, that uh, it turns out to be a, a very efficient way to solve some problems. But the problem with that is that the uh, traditional development assurance framework that is used by the uh, FAA and EASA does not actually have, have a good way of dealing with that. So there's a framework uh, that you have to follow if you want to uh, convince the regulator that your system is safe, which they absolutely should demand from you and you should demand from yourself. And this framework of rules and guidelines prescribes that you uh, first design uh, what the system is supposed to do. Uh, you do a safety analysis and then you follow a process to make sure that all your requirements are met. And in the way this is done, uh, there seems to be in conflict with the way machine learning works. So with that, there's a number of misconceptions uh, in the world, in the industry at large, but also way beyond that, that these modern uh, artificial intelligence techniques are uh, fundamentally ununderstandable. Nobody knows how they work. There's some black boxes, they do magic, and therefore they're fundamentally uncertifiable. And these are some of the phrases that are thrown around, you know, non-determinism, uh, untraceable, unpredictable. And these concerns are uh, it's justified to raise the concerns and they have to be addressed. Fortunately, many of them are misconceptions. So um, let's have a closer look at what this system, you know, a system like this does, uh, how it works in, in detail. So for example, for our traffic detection system, we take a high resolution camera, which has to be a reliable camera, you know, engineered to aviation standards so that, you know, it actually works. Uh, and then we extract a picture of our environment and then we do some image enhancement things which are entirely cl classical and well understood to make it the best possible picture, just like you would do if this was a system to increase vision for uh, artificial uh, synthetic vision systems for pilots. And then we apply what's called a deep convolutional neural network to this image, which is a piece of uh, computer code that was trained by another computer to recognize shapes that look like aircraft. And then once we have a box drawn around the aircraft in the picture, we can feed this to uh, traditional flight control systems that we can either warn the pilot if we're a pilot assistance, or we can directly talk to the autopilot to um, climb or descend or do something evasively. One of the things to address up front is this system does not magically you know, learn in flight. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to adapt itself and thereby become entirely unpredictable. So we don't have some some horror movie entity in a box that you know comes to the inside that it should you know, do terrible things uh, because that's just how we construct the thing. The other thing to realize is that the system is completely deterministic. If I show it the same image, you know, I can engineer it such that it will always draw the same box or not. So really what we have to do is that the thing is fit for purpose and safe enough and that the uh, quality of the boxes it draws around things in the image is of high enough quality. So about two years ago, we approached uh, the uh, European Union Aviation Safety Agency, EASA, uh, and we uh, proposed to them a program to look into how we could think about uh, guaranteeing the safety of a machine learned component in uh, safety critical avionics while sticking to the uh, letter or definitely the spirit of the existing re regulations as much as possible. So last March, we published a joint report together. Um, if you Google for EASA the Dalian, you will find uh, our public extract of the report. We keep some part of it as a secret source to ourselves, but uh, the bulk of it we published to the uh, industry working groups um, of Eurokai, Workgroup 114, uh, and uh, other industry bodies, uh, where I think it was well received, but you'll have to ask them. Um, so what this um, report, uh, what our research um, treated was how to um, uh, think about this assurance of uh, machine learning component. And I wanted to spend some time uh, talking about those details. So what is well known in the aviation industry and in uh, uh, avionics engineering is the so-called V model, where you go from high level requirements to low level requirements to a design and implementation of your system in hardware and software, 
and then you verify that these requirements were met when you go up the so-called V-shape. So it turns out that if you think about a machine learning system, much of that stays the same. And definitely the uh, ARP style safety engineering, is, there's no reason to change that. Uh, but where you go from the step where you specify how the software should work to how you write the software, in a machine learning system, you have to go look at the data you use and the training algorithm you use to guarantee that your implemented uh, system actually fulfills the purpose. So you have to start looking at the data and the requirements you put to the data. And there's a very important element. Uh, there's a set of so-called generalization theorems which are based in uh, mathematics, uh, in learning theory, which tell you that um, if you properly treat your data, you have uh, valid reasons to believe that your system will behave out there in the wild in flight, the same as it did in the lab, you know, provided you do everything right. And uh, to make sure that you fulfill these uh, meta requirements on your, on your process, we propose this uh, W, where you go uh, look at what your data should be when you train and test your system. Uh, you look at how you manage the process of machine learning uh, in the lab. You then train your model, which is the, the step that is different from you know, handwriting code. And then you verify that you've done that properly. And then in the second step, you roll out your model to the, um, you deploy it in the field and you have to verify that it works as intended and that the data that you've used is indeed representative of the data you uh, find in the wild. And it turns out if you follow that process, you have actually more reason to believe that your system will work as advertised with its flaws. So these systems are never perfect. Um, but um, that is the same for existing software. And no matter how many uh, how much process you impose on the development of classical software, there's always some unexpected bug because it is very hard to prove that software is correct for some very fundamental, also mathematical reasons. So with these machine learning components, you actually have a way to apply powerful field of statistics to get guarantees that, you know, 99.9 .9 out of uh, 100 times or 999 times out of a thousand times, uh, if we show uh, our system an image, it will properly recognize the runway. And now you'll say, well, that's terrible. You know, one in a thousand times, that's a disaster. But you have to realize we don't design the system such that, you know, it sees one image and it has to decide whether to land or not. We have this as part of a bigger system where, you know, we, we take an approach to uh, an expected runway. And once we are in the neighborhood, we start the camera and we start looking for uh, a runway. So, uh, for example, this is in the, in the example of runway guidance or the other way around. If we look at um, picture and we try to find other traffic in the air, you know, we don't just take one snapshot and then, you know, go back and study it. We have a continuous running camera that tries to look for these things. And it turns out that if in one picture you have a 99.9% uh, .9 chance of getting it right, then if you take multiple pictures and you take you construct your system properly, you can get the probability of the whole system malfunctioning sufficiently low to actually have stronger guarantees than you would have for classically written software, where it is always very hard to predict where the uh, errors are, are lurking. So ironically, with this uh, ill-understood black box magic, um, once you do it properly, you may actually end up with systems that are provably safer than so-called handcrafted code. This strongly depends on the application. So this is certainly not true for all problems in the world. Uh, it is true if you construct your avionics in modules and for some modules <clears throat> where you have to make these type of judgment calls, you can apply this machine learning component. So we would not advocate the setup where you magically connect the cameras and all the controls of the aircraft to a giant pot that you then machine learn to properly fly, you know, that is that is not how these things work. Uh, that is the material of uh, science fiction movies, but it's not uh, uh, actually relevant for how software engineering is done. So with that, I would like to open the floor to questions. But since this is uh, not a live session, I can only invite you to come look at our website and maybe submit questions to um, uh, the host or forward them to me in any way you see fit.
I thank you for your attention.